no, no, I, I, I think this, this piece will be an inspiration for a lot of people, at least in Indonesia, what you've just described about what you've gone through. Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing is to go out there and, and believe you can do anything. And it's your yeah. life. Too many yeah. Asian parents try to live their life through their kids. Yeah. And that's a mistake. Inilah Endgame. Talk, 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 to to talk about what was making the report so game changing. Uh, it just made sense. And I, I put it into pictorial format and I predicted, you know, I was, I was doing predictions on the music trends. And it was just that the report that was done was sales is bigger than last month by 30,000. Uh, Boring CD stuff. Sold yeah. more, CD sold more than cassettes. Right. And I kind of dug deeper into the report to kind of say there's a trend going here, wow. you know, and this music genre is happening and this is dying and, you know, we should get out of this. And, and so they said they'd never seen a finance guy talk about the A&R. And I said, well, it, wow. you've got to get behind the numbers, right? Yep. Otherwise, it's just numbers. Um, and so there they saw that I had a, a natural flair. They hadn't met an account who loved music so much. So they thought this was, I was a unique specimen of a human being, right? So I think they wanted to experiment whether this was, this was a, a, a good thing or a bad thing. So they, they, they suddenly come up and say, you're young. Why don't you go back to Malaysia and uh, be general manager of Warning Music Malaysia? Now, I had, I had literally, I'm kind of semi-white because I'd lived in England all my life, right? Um, you know, they call me a bounty bar. Brown on the outside and, and white on the inside. Your, yeah. your partner, Nazir Razak, is yeah. 100% white, by the way. <laughs> you, you, you know, <laughs> just to let you know. I'm going to have to cut that uh, out, man. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't. This is fact. Um, yeah. You know, in some countries, they call themselves uh, Oreos. Yeah, I know, I know. In, uh, in my time, it was called Bounty Bar. Brown on the outside, white on the inside. <laughs> coconut, coconut. Yeah. So... Um, so I never thought of living in Malaysia, right? I was like, but I didn't think, you know, us Asians, we analyze, talk to our grandmother, grandfather, friends before we make a decision, right? I just was like, I'm there. This was a great opportunity. And that's one thing I always tell people. If you get a chance, grab it. Yeah. Don't bloody, I agree. Don't ever look back twice. I agree. Um, us Asians procrastinate too frigging long, right? Yeah. Um, you're, so you're, gra- you're the complete manifestation of guts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I so mean, that's, that's, I what we got, that's what you got to tell the Asian boys and girls. It's all about yeah. guts, man. Yeah. Sorry, go on. go on. Got to take some risk. So I, so I, you know, I um, didn't ask my salary. I didn't ask anything. And then in a month's time, I was on a plane back to Malaysia. And the Malaysian company were like, who is this? young asshole coming back right they were like organizing a boycott of me they were like who is this 27 year old kid from london who's going to be our boss <laughs> you know and then there was an austrian dude uh who was a very nice guy he was um uh, the ceo of the company but he was on a holiday camp right he was sure, just sure doing nothing didn't know what he was doing and, and the boys below were doing something and warner music had a good reputation it had some good artists, but it had, it, I, I joined it at, at the bottom. They just lost their biggest artists, you know, by forgetting to extend the contract. Literally, oh the God. secretary forgot to extend it. Oh my God. And she walked into EMI, her name was Ella. And so the company was in very low morale. And uh, I came in, the CEO let me do whatever I want. And within, you know, six months, we had cleaned up the company, we signed a lot of artists, and it had record profitability. Um, and then the Americans, being the Americans, came down and said, boy, you're running this company, you might as well be CEO. And so they sacked the Austrian guy, who was a decent guy. And uh, of course, I landed on my feet. I became CEO at 27 years old. Of one well done, well done. And then I had you know, 12 years of developing local music, uh, you know, I, I signed Chris Dianti. Uh, here's a good Indonesian story, right? Here's a good Indonesian story. So I'm coming out to set up Warning Music Indonesia. It was uh, Sohato's time. And yep. Not easy for a foreign company to come in, right? And so I'm working with a, 
a great bunch of guys, Musica, PT Musica. Yeah, Musica. They're still um, around. Not as big, and though. I'm sitting in my, yeah, I'm sitting in my, in my hotel room in Grand Hyatt, right? And, uh, you know, I, I'm watching TV and I see this girl on TV. And I call out Achu, Sanjaya. Sure. Uh, Indonesia, you, you always have two names for, mm -hmm. for everybody. And uh, he, I said, hey, Chu, there's this amazing singer on TV. Can we go sign her up? And he, he says, I don't know who she is. I said, well, come up, come up to the room and watch her. She's amazing. And uh, he, he, he was just in the room next door or something. And he came in and watched it. It was Asia Bagus. And he said, okay, I'll go check out who she is. And this he, was and in the early 90s, right? Says, yeah. yeah. Says, Her name is Chris Dianti. And I said, wow, let's go sign her up now. And she is amazing. Yeah. And then uh, he comes back and he says, hey, she lives. So I said, so what? He said, that take a long time to get there. I said, I don't care. And I, I was a Kuala Lumpur boy, right? I mean, how right. big could Jakarta be? But three <laughs> hours later, <laughs> we arrived in South Jakarta. And at that point, I realized how big your country was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I met Anand, yep. uh, who, who was my yep. boyfriend at the time. Yep, yep. And it was a buy one, get one free. I had to sign. So you signed two singers. Oh, my. I had to sign Anand as well. Okay. Uh, so so that, was, that was Chris. a condition. That was a condition yeah, was from condition. them. Okay. That was a condition. Which would have been Anand. the right decision anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Anand was writing all those songs anyway. Yeah, and then you know we we signed Project P, and I I tried to sign Kla Project. I had a great run in Indonesia actually, and I got into Dundu. I I discovered Dundu in Indonesia, right? Yeah, and I was like, wow, this is great music. And so I upmarket Dundu. I took all the Indonesian music back to KL, and I was the Dundu king. I, you I, know, I created something out of nothing, and then I found Nashid music, and uh, you know. Kind of weird, right? The time Warner was half Jewish, yeah. and here I am <laughs> producing Nashid music and making the biggest album ever, Raihan, 1.4 million units. So I had a great, great career, and I signed Sheila, yep, and Zainal, and you know, so I had all kinds of music, and uh, I, had a, I, I loved it. It was probably you, my most. You know, Warner music got spun of off. Life. Warner music got spun off from Time Warner. Yeah. What, what, yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Before that, so my whole career, the whole Air Asia story came out. I always thought I was going to die in the music business. And that I wanted to be president of Warner Music. That was my, my goal yep. in life. Mm. I'll be the first Asian to run an American record company. And so one day, I'd been through three mergers, right? It started with um, uh, the first merger was Time, Time Warner. Right. Which I, which is a crazy merger, and then CNN came along, yeah, and then the craziest merger of all, I think, the AOL. dumbest deal in the history, AOL. With the benefit so of I'm hindsight, sitting in yeah. Seven, I'm sitting, yeah, I'm sitting in Seventy Five Rock, thinking, listening to Steve Case and Bob Pittman, and thinking, yep. what drugs are these guys taking? You know, please give me some of it. And uh, I was thinking, these guys are going to destroy this company. Mm. And they're all talking about $500 stock prices. And this was the first dot-com boom. And, uh, you know, I sat there and I thought, that's it. You know, my whole life is like that. I suddenly realized, that's it. Time to get out. Yeah. And my whole career was made on one thing. Steve Case says to me, Tony, what do you reckon our stock price should be in a year's time? Now, in my heart, it was $80 at that time, 2001. Yeah. I thought, wow, listening to you. If it's still $80, you're doing well. But I, <laughs> but I knew I couldn't say that. So I said $90. You, 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 were, you were, okay. You were a polite Asian boy. Yeah. He said, I said $90 and you went wrong boy, $500. And then my famous mouth opened and I said, please give me some of the drugs you are taking. <laughs> and at that point I knew my career was over at one music. So I walked out of the room. I sold my stock options at seventy-eight dollars, um, did okay. Of which the price the price never came anywhere near that. Yeah, again, it came down to twenty dollars at one stage. Yep, you did. And okay. uh, I went to my boss, 
And I said, I quit. He was thrilled because he always wanted to get rid of me. He thought I was after his job, which I was. Mm. And so before I could change my mind, he wrote me a check and I said goodbye. Um, and I left New York and I arrived in London thinking, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? And uh, I went to a bar, pub, contemplating what I'm going to do. And this is, this is absolutely true. There's no exaggeration here. Right? I saw Stelios of EasyJet on, on TV. Uh, and I thought, wow, what a great idea. And I always loved planes. From five years old, I always said to my dad I was going to own an airline. No you know, kidding. I never said I want to be a yeah. I never said I want to be a pilot or anything like that. You, you said that before you got on the Qantas flight to go to London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because no my, my, me and my dad were plane spotters, and I even see. at school, I see my best friend Charlie. We used to go to Queen's Building at Heathrow Airport and just watch planes. Wow. Uh, and, and and maybe I like the crew in the planes as well. <laughs> so we we um, you know I I thought this is it. This is my destiny. And so I grabbed a bus, very appropriately, a green line bus as well, that took me to Luton Airport. And I saw everything in orange and people flying to Barcelona for eight pounds, Paris for six pounds. And I thought, this is amazing. And at that moment, I said, I'm going to do this. Hmm. And there's a very fine line between brilliance and stupidity. It's really very narrow. But I thought, hey, I'm 30 plus. If I fail, you know, I fail. But I don't, want to, I don't want to think at 50 that I wish I did it. Uh, that, and that's my second moral. If there's a moral in this podcast is that don't be afraid of failure. You got to just go out and do sure. it. If you fail, you fail. But I like you, that. Can't press that re, you can't press that rewind button. Yeah. You can't say, oh, I wish I did it. This is mm. too late. So my whole life has been taking those chances. Some have been disastrous. Some have been great. But... I've never had any regrets. I've never sat there and said, I wish I did it because I did it. If I get knocked down by a bus tomorrow and there are many people who would like to drive that bus, um, you know, I would have lived a great life. I've had no regrets. I've lived yeah. my life to the full. Yeah. So, so yeah, at that point I decided, I called my wife, who's my ex-wife now, and uh, said, I'm going to start an airline after she stopped laughing. She said, why don't you start a bread shop? You know, you've got the stomach for it. And uh, I said, no, no, I've got this vision. And that was it. There was no stopping me. It Bro, was that I, moment don't, don't in you Hampstead think, Heat. You know, what, what do you think that you might have gone through that was different from the typical Asian who didn't want to take as much risk as you, as you did? I mean, mm. there, there's this element of nurture versus nature, right? Which, which yeah. I like to talk about with, with some people lately. Yeah. Um, yeah, was my... There's that great movie, right? I don't know if you ever watched it with Eddie Murphy, Trading Places. Yeah, sure. Great movie. Uh, watched which, it a few times. All, yeah. about, all, all about environment. And yeah. Being put. I, I definitely, England gave me a different perspective of life. Okay. Um, Branson gave me that hey, you can do anything you want to do, right? Right. I mean, you go out there, say you want to start an airline. Yeah. Or you want to go do Virgin Brides or whatever. Yeah. And then I think coupled with my mother who really did anything she wanted to do and, and did it very well. Yeah. So I think it's all those factors that led me to believe that, you know, I could achieve anything I want to do if I put my mind to it. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a boy's own story. It hasn't been incredibly successful, but, yeah. you know, I, I loved Formula One from a very early age. I, yeah. I, I loved football. Not many agents have had that ability to do what I've yeah. done. Uh, not successful, but hey, I did it, you know, yeah. and, and that's, uh, that's kind of what I've always been. Yeah. Uh, you know, people talk about how, how much more wealthy I could have been if I wasn't in football and F1 and all these yeah. things, but I don't measure my life through how much wealth I get. And that's a strange concept for, in, for Malaysians and Indonesians and Thais. For, for most Asians. Because yeah, because they're all there yeah. about well, how many billions do I have? And I'm sure. richer than the next billionaire. Sure. But for me, I think my life has been meaningful. I've built something that's created 25,000 jobs and built an industry and we've inspired lots of people. And, yeah. and so I'm a builder more than... Wealth is a nice product, let's be real. Yeah. But it doesn't motivate me that yeah. much, to be honest. 
Yeah. No, no, I, I, I think this, this piece will be an inspiration for a lot of people, at least in Indonesia, what you've just described about what you've gone through. Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing is to go out there and, and believe you can do anything. And it's your yeah. life. Too many yeah. Asian parents try to live their life through their kids. Yeah. And that's a mistake. Yeah. You know, there are too many doctors out there who really shouldn't be doctors. Yeah. Uh, I didn't tell you, but you know, from the moment I was born, I had a stethoscope around me. Right. My first toy, my first toy was a doctor's kit. Right. Um, I, you know, I was like, and that wasn't sexual, by the way, either. I had a doctor's coat. So I, I, I want to ask I, you, I, <laughs> I want to ask you this though. If if you were the director of the Crazy Rich Asians movie, yeah, how yeah. would you have narrated it differently? Oh wow, you know. I didn't watch the movie. So it's kind of, <laughs> Sorry, wrong it's question. Kind of, kind of <laughs> tough. But it's really funny. There's another funny story there, right? So I'm in Singapore and someone sends me a message and says, hey, Michelle, Yo is upstairs and she's looking for you. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, great. And she says she hasn't seen you for a while. Come up and say hello. So I went upstairs to speak to her. And then I said, hey, how come you're not in that movie, Crazy Rich Asians? Because you're a real bitch. You'd fit that part really well. And she said, but you're such an asshole, Tony. I am in that movie. Went, oh, oh my god! I said, oh didn't my look god! Like you. <laughs> no, I, I think hey, you would have you you would have directed it very differently. You would have told I a very different I story. Would've. Yeah, very different story. And um, I mean, it was Americanized, right? There are yeah. lots of Singaporean bits in sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. You know what? Where it really is crazy. It should have been crazy rich Indonesians because uh, <laughs> no, no, oh, crazy, crazy rich, rich Malaysians. <laughs> oh, crazy rich Thais, man! Oh no, no, the Malaysians and Thai Malaysians cannot keep up with the Indonesians. Oh, You're in another yeah. league. You're just very good at hiding it. Uh, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, we, but there we go. I want. I want to push you on this. Uh, I know you didn't like the merger between AOL and Time Warner. But what you think yeah. of the merger between Time Warner and AT&T Wireless? Don't you think that was the right thing? Um, Combining yeah, contents uh, with the pipe? Yeah, but a bit late, you know, yeah. a bit late. Okay. Uh, if they'd done it like, I mean, the whole concept of AOL was the right concept. Yeah. But they were too pioneering, right, at the time. And like the music guys didn't want to, didn't want to subscribe to digital music. Um, there was no Netflix platform. So it was stillborn, right? Um, right idea, uh, yeah. marrying content with, uh, with platform, yeah. which is what we've got in super apps, you know, right. it's, it's content, etc. And AT&T was right, but they, they've missed the boat, right? Yeah. Movies have gone to Netflix and all the channels and uh, you know, the relevance of the mobile phone is purely a platform now as opposed right. to controlling revenue because when you, when you have a mobile phone, you're downloading everyone else's apps, right? Yeah. Whether it's Netflix or Spotify, uh, et cetera. So uh, right time, uh, you know, even HBO was the leader in content. Oh, they've got the you biggest know, they, library. They, yeah. they, they were the kings, but they right. missed the boat, right? And only mm. now they've launched HBO Max, right. which is, you know. Yeah, a few years late. The, the, the trains left the station, right? Yeah. You, you've got Amazon in there. You've got Apple. You know, Netflix, Apple. And, yeah. and, I mean, Apple's got like a trillion dollars and they're so far away as well, right? So, yeah. you know. You Mr. think they'll Mr. pull Trump. it off? You think they'll be able to pull it off in the next few years or is it just too big to figure AT &T it out? AT&T and Time Warner? Yeah. No, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's too late. Okay. And I mean, they were, you know, they're losing a lot of great talent. A lot of great HBO guys have gone. And, that, and that's one of the problem with mergers. Mergers look great at Harvard Business School, but the reality is it's about culture. Yeah, you know, I agree. AirAsia and MAS on paper in Harvard would look like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but, you know, and all you Harvard guys would say, yeah, let's do it. And you'd yeah. have all the binomial distributions and the, yeah. uh, the, the create, creation of wealth. But the reality is if cultures don't get sure. on it's going to be a, a, a weapon of mass destruction, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that's, you know, that's why you're happening with AT&T, which is really a traditional kind of FMCG telecom company. Right. Mixing with creative guys. Yeah. Uh, it ain't going to happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so uh, I was talking, I was yeah. talking to um, Mike Sivert, who's the, the CEO of T-Mobile, sure. who, yeah. who was really the brains behind 
you know, John Lejeune got a lot of yeah. credit. He's an incredible guy. And I, yeah, yeah. I love him to death. Yeah. And, uh, but they, they realize they're still a mobile operator, right? That they, yeah. And, and, and they've just become number one now in the States. Yep. They've done an incredible job, incredible branding and customer service job. Yep. Yep. Hey, uh, let's talk about the airline. You started it in 2001 and you've, you've, you've gotten what more than 600 million people to travel all over the world or, or mostly Southeast Asia. That's, that's an incredible achievement. Uh, talk, talk a little bit more about Air Asia and your journey. Yeah. Wow. My journey is <laughs> rock and roll, man. Yeah. Um, it's, old, it's more, old, it's more old. rolling though than rock. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, a, it's been a great, it's been a, I mean, you know, if you've seen this in the movies, you'd say only, it only happens in the movies, right? Uh, a music exec, uh, a banker, another music exec, um, and a retired a retired civil servant, right? Who used to wear a bow tie, go out there and say we're going to start an airline. It's like you know, the Tom Cruise movie, right? Um, you know, it ain't going to happen. Or an Adam Sandler movie playing golf. Yeah. Um, so yeah. You're talking about famous. Jerry Maguire. I'm talking about Jerry Maguire. Okay, that was a great about, movie. Uh, yeah, that, that one. How you recreate become... yourself? How you repurpose yourself? Correct. Yeah. So, you know, and yeah, it's been an incredible ride to go from two planes to 265 planes. We're back to two planes, by the way. So, you know, it's like that. It's, it's, a, it's like that. People say to me, Tony, how can you make jokes about this? And I say, hey, you got to laugh, right? You can't cry. So I said, it's like that snakes and ladders game, right? You get mm. up to square 98 and, and then there's a snake that takes you all back down to three. So, so I'm back down there, man. But uh, it, it's a great chance to, I, it's a second chance to rebuild. You know, I disagree. I think, I think you've created, you've created such a big brand. I mean, your brand equity is up there. You, you're not at level oh, three. Yeah, you're, no. you're, I think you're oh, no, moving no. from 98 to 97. Yeah, no, no, you're right. And yeah. I mean, you know, while, while it, it's, it's wonderful to hear it in such a positive way. Right. We do, we are, we are really also starting from ground zero as well but we have a great brand yeah and we have great people so that's a big plus from start setting it up in 2001 but the very nature of our airline in 2001 was out of born out of a travesty right uh, or calamity which was 9 11. yeah um you know so while i've experienced everything from you know sars to bird flu to terrorism in indonesia to Airports closed in Thailand to tsunamis, earthquakes. I mean, COVID is something, something else. I thought I'd seen it all. Yeah. But you know, we're very resilient. Yeah. And uh, we've got a product that people want. Uh, we just got to be patient and wait for the borders to open. Uh, but from a domestic standpoint, uh, we're doing all right. Um, and yeah, the journey's been incredible. I mean, you know, if you had told me 18 years ago, I'm going to be interviewed by Gita, you know, a lot. Uh, um, I was, you know, I was looking up to you, man, back then. I still look up to you now. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if uh, you know, if we created so many jobs, which is the biggest thing, it's the biggest thrill in my life. And the fact that I've taken kids who left school at 13 and made them pilots and stuff, it's incredible. It's amazing. And, and, and made, made, air, made ASEAN a smaller place. Yeah. Uh, you know, people going to Bandung. I yep. started Bandung, Gita. No one flew to Bandung. No yeah. one. Yeah. Not, no Indonesian airline. Only the Indonesian yep. Air Force, right? And I knew Bandung because I used to record Dangdut music there. Right? Remember, I was the Dangdut king. And uh, By the way, we're going to get a, get a Dangdut singer in this studio in the next few days. Yeah, I'm not going to mention that? the name. Rama? No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what about talk about Bandung? I mean, you know, that was I don't yeah. think it was just guts. I think it was intuition, which, yeah, which was, a lot of people don't so, have, like you do. Yeah, so I used to drive to Bandung, you know, from Jakarta. We'd stop in uh, that hill resort mm. uh, on the way. Yeah, Puncak Pas. And yeah, correct. Yeah. Puncak Mas. Yeah, what a great place. Yeah, many stories that can't be repeated on your podcast. <laughs> but um, and. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I said to my team, hey, why don't we fly to Bandung? And they looked at me and said, oh, no airline flies there. 
I said, so what? We're going to be the first airline. There is ITB. There's a great music scene. The yeah. people there are awesome. Yeah. There's a great textile industry. f and uh, The, the yeah. food and beverage scene. Also. I said, I don't care. We're going to fly there. I'll, I'll, I'll make the recommendation for them to give you an award. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah, they should give me one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we, it wasn't an Indonesian airline. It was, at that time, we only had a Malaysian airline. It was Malaysia Air Asia who flew to Bandung. And uh, it wasn't Singapore Airlines. It wasn't any of these big guys. We saw Bandung before anybody. And I saw it because of the people. I thought the people were special. Yeah. You know, there was a Dundut singer that I knew well there, Chichi Faramida. And, yep. uh, you know, she was awesome. And all her friends and everything. So, the spirit of Bandung was something that I didn't see anywhere else in the world. And I wanted people to see it. And that's, that's an, that's, those are the kind of stories that no one can take away from you, right? That yeah. Asia went out there and created a market and created jobs for people that just never thought. And I mean, the airport's now a big airport with 24 airlines. Yeah. yeah. Right? yeah. Hey, look, you're, you're one of the very few people that basically pushed for the open sky policy. Yeah, in, in ASEAN, right? A lot of a lot of people yeah. don't know that. You know, talk talk a little yeah. bit about your struggles. You know, earlier on, how you pushed wow. the governments to open up. You know, their yeah. skies because you lit up the fire on tourism for ASEAN. You yeah. know, I, I think you deserve that credit. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I had made a lot of enemies in that process. But I remember <laughs> one famous story. We were in Singapore, the ASEAN transport meeting. <laughs> I think I made myself famous over this. The, the Singaporean, you don't need to mention names. <laughs> Singaporean, minister, Singaporean minister said something about open skies. And I said, how much sky do you have actually in Singapore? <laughs> Which kind of made, banned me from Singapore about seven years, I think. Uh, oh my God. But, uh, but all the ASEAN ministers suddenly came up to me and said, hey, you know, wow, we really like your comment. We would like to have said that ourselves. And then they started getting into it. And I, that's how I, was kind of my breakthrough in many ways. And then I started kind of pushing it. And it was, it's very tough because let me tell you one thing, Gita, airlines are almost like the national flag of the country. Right, right. They have enormous, enormous power. Sure. You know, tell it's like about Singapore it. Airlines. Singapore Airlines is probably more famous than anything in Singapore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it carries the Singapore flag. Right. I mean, all of us carry our country's flag. We, I mean, Air Asia Indonesia has the Indonesia flag, but it's like the national airline. It's almost like your flag, right? I mean, even in Korea, it's owned by a private company, but Korean airlines, like, well, it's Korean, right? right. It's, it, this is our flag carrier. It's not owned by the government. It's owned by some shipping dudes. So that, is the, that was the hardest thing because I had, you know, unlike UK, which had deregulated and British Airways was owned by the public and all this sure. kind of stuff. I was dealing with national carriers <laughs> oh my God. who invariably all their mates were in the Ministry of Transport as well, right? Yeah. Malaysian Airlines, Garuda International, Thai International, Singapore Airlines. You know, this is like Nightmare on Elm Street, part four, right? Yeah. Um, and then you have Philippine Airlines. So it was real tough, real, real tough. But you know how I got it? I got it by firstly going to places that none of these guys wanted to go to and then delivering. And then people were my biggest advocate. Sure. People sure. wanted AirAsia to come to yeah. their town. Yeah. Um, and so... And the government you know, can't say no to the people. No, that's right. Many politicians said to me, you know, your greatest success in winning us was that you were so popular with the people yeah. that we couldn't take you on. I and told you about politics. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we, we were the, you know, we were the, maybe we lived a lot of people's lives that they liked to see that the small guy was fighting the big guy. And yeah, it was tough because I had, a, I only had the media and many, many government officials to this day dislike me because they think I'm arrogant or I'm pushy. I'm not, I'm the simplest guy in the world, but I, my job is to open up the skies, right? So I pushed very hard. And, right. you know, we, we, we painted ASEAN on our plane. We were pushing ASEAN like anywhere. And, and yeah. I think, yeah, it's worth we, We've got this ASEAN thing happening. Well, e even I fly your airline very frequently. I know. You, you can check we, on we, your computers. 
You know, we do. We love you flying it, man. <laughs> Except I don't get a discount. <laughs> but but here's the thing. That. <laughs> you know, you know what I like about how you spearheaded this thing on tourism because it's the only sector where you can create jobs a lot more easily than any other sector, right? And I think it's very yeah. important for Southeast Asian countries. Yeah. You know, it takes a yeah. lot more money for a manufacturing job as opposed to a tourism job. And, and I think Correct. you've done a lot for Southeast Asia. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think when, of course, and, and the beauty is when, when someone like us comes along, it's going to be emulated, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. You know, so you have every animal airline now, and you've got lions, you've got tigers, you've got flies, you've got all kinds of things, right? Tons of birds uh, all over the place. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know why. Anna, I don't well, know why we, we haven't seen a grasshopper. No, <laughs> in, Malaysia, we, in Malaysia, we have firefly. That's a really dumb name for an airline, by the way. It's the shortest living insect in the insect kingdom. But, um, you know, I don't know why airlines, by the way, you should do an interview on this, why airlines are obsessed with animal names. But there you go. Most of them are birds. You think Garuda, you think Not Air, et cetera. But going back, AirAsia started that, and of course, many, many joined it, which, which is good, because right. competition is good. And it opened up the markets more and travel became a commodity um, and created a lot of jobs. And this is now our challenge now because Asia is so, Southeast Asia is so dependent on tourism. Right. Yet people are so scared of COVID. And I think we've got to, we've got to balance that out. You know, we can't live in a cave for the rest of our lives. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we've lived with the flu. We've lived with HIV. We've lived with lots of things. So we're just going to have to live with COVID because... It is what it is. Yeah. And, but, you know, Southeast Asian governments have done too good a scare job. Yeah. And, and right now, doctors are in control. And my dad was a doctor, so that's a scary thought. Um, but we need, we need to balance that out. People need to live and people need to go on. And, uh, you know, Sweden's done a pretty good job with the, immu the herd mentality. Yeah, herd immunity. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think it's a very different world now because we know COVID. We can contact trace. We can isolate people, we can isolate places. And uh, we need, you know, we've been very good at locking down. We haven't been so good at unlocking. And so yep. that's got to be how we move out. Because tourism is an important part of our industry, uh, of our economic, of our GDP. We need to find ways to unlock that. And I've always said Indonesia has, you know, been one of the most underrated tourism spots. It's only Bali. But, no kidding. Oh my God, yeah. there's Ra Raja Ampat, there's, you know, uh, there's so many places. Yeah, man. Um, and and I think that you know, hopefully, we can get people comfortable. Yeah. Um, and uh, restart this amazing journey that we we had started with, along with a lot, lot of other airlines. I've been talking a lot about this. You know, there is no reason for Indonesia not to expect 150 million tourists a year, as opposed yeah. to what the last yeah. number would have been 15 million last year. Yeah. Correct. I mean. You know, and the connectivity is getting built, you know, a lot yeah. faster and a lot more than ever. So yeah, we're going to get there. Saw yeah. that a long time ago. Yeah. And uh, you have a lot of regional airports. I hope you don't lose that. You know, there's some talk about making airports, a lot of airports just domestic and making big hubs. No, I mean, they got to they gotta inter internationalize. Yeah. Yeah. Direct connectivity is still the best way. Yeah. The world. Inilah Endgame. Episode Endgame Berikutnya. Dude, I, I can see you as a big technology player in the next few years. I, th I think you're yeah, morphing you know, from a music guy to an airline guy and sort of like doing sports in between and morphing into a tech guy. Uh, I think yeah. you're going to be big if you do this. We, will, we, always, we always were a tech company. Yep. Um, if you okay. think about it, we were the first airline to use the internet. No one used the internet before AirAsia. Yep. 